everyone, um, thanks for joining us. And as all of you know, we're in the middle of Alert uh, Level 4 as part of our response to the global pandemic of COVID-19. And of course, this is a time where we're asking everyone to stay at home, stay in their bubbles uh, and save lives. But we don't underestimate what a huge task that is. And so uh, to help us on that journey, I thought I would ask some experts and who better um, than Nigel Latter. Many of you will know Nigel, of course, he's a psychologist, um, an author, uh, and produced an amazing uh, resource after the Christchurch earthquakes to help people cope with the trauma and the aftermath of that event in New Zealand. And so, Nigel, thank you so much for joining um, us today. And I thought I would start by asking you, how's your bubble? Well, so I'm quite lucky uh, in the sense that I don't have little children. So I've got a 20-year-old who's in his own bubble in Wellington uh, with, his, with his flatmates uh, and a 17-year-old who's essentially been self-isolating for two years now. So, you know, like it, apart from the fact that, you know, the things that we just can't go out and do, our, our bubble's very peaceful and quiet. Are you, is there anything with your having um, teenagers, is there anything specific though that you're noticing or that you're very mindful of with having teenagers in your house? Um, I just think it's super hard for them because like for us, um, it makes no difference to us because we see him once a day at dinner time. <laughs> so, but for him um, and for his friends uh, and his cousins and lots of young people, it is super hard because they can't go out and see their friends. So one of the things that I've been saying to parents is don't, they're going to be grumpy and unhappy. And if they just want to retreat to their room for four weeks and you see them in the end, that's okay. You know, just let them do it. And it's really hard because they want to have contact with their friends. And so, I mean, just yesterday we had a conversation because he said, is it okay if I meet my friend, but we walk on opposite sides of the street, like we walk a street apart? And I said, well, so in theory it is because you can't catch the virus across the street. But here's the problem with that. A, other people are going to see you walking around talking to your friend and that's going to make other people more stressed. Mm -hmm. And even though I believe that you wouldn't meet, uh, you know, wouldn't cross the street and meet, maybe some other teenager sees you with your friend and so you get this behavioural leak. And so I said, you know, what we've been told is not to do that. Uh, and so even though he lives two streets away, just don't do it. And, and you know, uh, to his credit, he accepted that and went back downstairs and <laughs> he came out later. <laughs> and so and for, for those teenagers who are used to having so much connection with, yeah. um, with their friends and their peer group, is there any substitute for that? Yeah, devices are huge. Like, you know, I think people worry a lot about young people and devices, um, but, but don't. <laughs> having access to the internet and having access to, devi to devices and talking on all the various platforms that they do and Snapchatting each other and doing all of that kind of stuff um, is hugely important. So, so, so give them basically unfettered access to their devices and to the internet. And don't worry if they live the vampire lifestyle of young people, which is they're up till two o'clock in the morning and they get up at, at one o'clock. The people, I always think the people with little kids who are still getting up at five o'clock in the morning are going to listen to people, teenagers, complaining about them getting up at lunchtime and they'll be thinking, just shut up, that sounds amazing. <laughs> And so that would really surprise people. Some people think that the access to too much screen time is really negative, but you're saying for adolescents to accept that that's just part of their connection? Yeah, it's a huge part of their connection. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet about, you know, d d screen time and how it damages this and damages that. When you dig down into the actual science, there isn't a clear picture that lots of device use um, damages young people in any way. And certainly, um, if it's over the period of a few weeks, um, it's not going to do them any harm at all. The, the most important thing, um, and this is what I've been talking to parents about a lot, your single most important job is to keep stuff calm and settled in your home. And so device time, whether they're older kids or little kids, um, is really going to help with that. So you should not feel like you're a bad parent or you're not doing your job because you're letting them play Call of Duty all day, or you're letting your six-year-old watch stuff on telly all day, you're four, you know, like, just put all that stuff aside. No harm will come to children from watching lots of screens over the next few weeks. 
You make, a, you make a really interesting point in there that the underlying job of parents at the moment is going to be to help with children or young people's anxiety. Um, do you have any tips on how parents right now talk to their children or young people about what's going on around them? Yeah, I think it's really important to kind of make a policy as a, as a bubble, have your bubble policy about information and how much of that stuff you're going to expose people to. Because the reality is pretty much now we know the things that we're expected to do we don't have to be constantly watch. We don't have to be constantly tuning into that stuff. So what we should do, um, particularly if children are younger, is just to uh, just to avoid watching the news all day because it will just frighten and upset them. Um, so if there are two of you in a house or there's one of you in the house, make a policy about how you're going to get information about what's going on. But I would say with little kids, shield them from that as much as you possibly can. If they ask questions, you should talk to them about stuff. But it isn't good for them, or to be honest, or for us, to dwell on the stuff. I don't watch the news all the time because it's bad for me, uh, and it just makes me go, hmm. Oh. Um, there, are, there are other things I can do with my time. And so it's really important, I think, to, to shield little kids from the news. Teenagers are going to find out that stuff anyway. They're going to they're gonna sort it out. They're going to look at it. Um, and then it's just about talking. It's about having that conversation with them. It's about us kind of modeling doing the right things ourselves. Um, it's about us trying to kind of keep calm and we're not always gonna be able to keep calm and that's fine too. Um, but it's really just about little kids, shield them from as much information as you kind of think is, 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 is that you can. And older kids, when it comes up, just talk to them about it. And so you, you touched on a little bit there, um, uh, ways to uh, help young people or at least shield them a little bit. But what about adults who might really be uh, just craving news and might potentially be fixating on news around the virus um, and really, really putting a lot of energy and focus into getting that information all the time? Do you have any tips for, for them? Yeah, so I think it's really important for people to understand that even though we're sort of modern humans and we've got all this amazing technology, we've got brains that are 70,000 years old and they're not used to threats like this. The, 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 the threat for most of human history was, oh, I think it's going to eat me. Um, and then it either did or it didn't, but the situation resolved itself pretty quickly. So this thing is going on for a long time and your brain is going to want to focus in on that information but what you have to do is you can't let your brain make all the decisions about the stuff that's happening because what will happen is the more of that stuff that you consume the worse you will feel um, and it will make you just want to sit on the couch and look at that stuff and it's pretty much the worst thing that you can do and so Making a decision to step away from all of that is is really important. I mean, I, I've been dealing with it pretty well, but to be honest, it was some opinion pieces about the economic stuff that started to freak me out. And then I, I was reading this thing and thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And I thought, you know, why am I doing this? Like, this, a, this is an opinion piece that some, some dude is saying stuff. No one knows what's going to pan out. It doesn't help me now. So what are the things... That are going to help me now and, and, and one of the things that i used to do when i was working clinical cases and sometimes you would be working a, a, a family where it's just enormously complicated and i had no idea what to do because it's like it's i don't know it's too complicated so what i would think was okay i need to start shrinking it down until i get to a simple thing that i can do and people need to do that in their lives now so if you consume the news and you look at the global figures uh, and you're watching trends and numbers and all that kind of stuff and you're looking at the economic doom and gloom stuff that's there's nothing you can do about that that's going to make you feel bad you just have to keep pulling that focus in. sometimes that means that, that what you can do in the moment the best thing you can do for yourself and your family and your career and everything is just to turn off the telly to put down the device and stop looking at that stuff um, and get some fresh air or do something around the house or uh, go and chat with the kids and see how they're doing it's like you just need to bring your focus in until you find a simple thing that you can do and then do that thing. Is that, would that be your advice? I mean, I think you touched in there on probably some of the anxiety that a lot of people will be facing just generally, but there'll be some people, of course, who are facing anxiety around what their job prospects or their employment is looking like. Yeah. 
in this really uncertain time. Now we are doing as much as we can to give yep. as much support and certainty as we can. But you've touched on some tips in there around dealing with that kind of anxiety, but is there anything further you think people should consider? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things I think it's, it's the, the comfort we can all take is that everybody is in that same boat. It, my old job used to be public speaking. <laughs> So that as a that is a job that's disappeared for a little while, right? Surprisingly, we're not in essential service right now, and so 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 every and I know lots of people I know who would never have thought that they would be in this position are in the same position, and so what it's about is nothing is clear at the moment. We know that all of us are in this thing together not just as a as a, not even just new zealand the entire world is in this thing so there are a whole lot of things that need to be worked out but the most important things that we can do now are do the simple things that will make a difference so it is kind of registering for the employer scheme it's it's the it's the stuff that you can do that will ease things immediately it's if you have worries about mortgage or rent having those conversations doing the practical things that you can do but if you don't know what's going to be happening with your job, you can't do anything about that right now. And so what you need to do is just, again, bring it back to the simple stuff that you can do now, and that will unfold over time. It's, it's, um, it doesn't help to be catastrophizing or obsessing or going around and around it. Like, big changes are coming, but they're coming for everybody we're all in the same thing together and that's uh you know it's i think it's particularly hard if you're in a factory that closes down a small town and the rest of the country's humming along it's just you right it's everyone yeah. <laughs> and so clearly after this the world is going to be a different place to what it is now but now and today this afternoon um this morning whenever the thing that you have to do now is to focus on what you can change now. And so the best thing that you can do for yourself when the scenes is breaking it down. Into oh, is it breaking up? Yeah, breaking it down. Yeah, oh, yeah into, sorry. Uh, breaking it down into tasks that someone can. Yeah, break it down into simple steps. <laughs> what can I do now? What can I do this afternoon? Yeah, absolutely. And so those are some really good tips again for um, adults. Uh, one of the things, again, I just wanted to jump into in a little bit more detail. I saw, uh, I've been trying to keep a little eye on um, feedback and comments from people on social media because it gives me the closest uh, insight into how people are feeling and some of the concerns they have on their minds. And one comment stood out to me. It was, um, it was in response to, um, I think, a press conference where I was talking about, you know, the impacts of having kids at home for a long period of time. And someone wrote, um, I really don't understand why do people keep talking about how difficult it will be with their children? Um, don't people like having children? <laughs> and I think the point I was wanting to convey here, of course, is, of, I mean, of course, we adore our children. We love our children deeply more than life itself yeah. um, but of course we're constantly wanting to make sure that we can do our best by them and when they're often when they're small um, they need a lot of stimulus they need a lot of energy they need a lot of attention and four-week isolation makes that tough so uh, I was just going to say ask have you got tips for parents how to keep little ones particularly entertained through a period like this yeah, it's like look, kids are draining. Like the kind of people that say, "Don't people like the kids?" Well, I think clearly don't have children because like, I love my boys dearly. But there are times when I literally felt I, my head was going to explode from rage when they were like four and a half, five, and it wasn't because they were doing anything terrible. They were just super annoying. So it's really hard. And some kids have lots of energy and they need um, a lot more input. So so a large part of it is kind of it's a good time to really start thinking about your kid's temperament and the sorts of stuff that they need. Like if you've got a really energetic kid they're just going to need to do a lot of really energetic stuff and so that means you have to figure out ways that you can cater for that um, and maybe just accept a bit more chaos in the background yeah. you know maybe in the old days you would have tied it up or let them just do stuff in the room no nah, let them chuck everything on the floor you know let them run around on bench tops and do the do the stuff that they need um it's 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 just about having those strategies and, and I think there are a couple of things too. It is about like screen time again. It's it can be really useful. Don't feel bad about it. It's fine. Um if your kids are school age kids and you're currently 
be having big conflict and arguments about doing schoolwork, don't. <laughs> you know, it's great that teachers have put resources in place, and there are some kids that will love that. But I know there are parents who are getting into conflict with their kids because they feel like their kids should do this stuff, and they're somehow failing them if they're not. No, they're not. What the science actually says is that even over the holidays for a lot of children um, when they're not at school their academic stuff goes up so nothing is going to happen to your kids if they decide not to do schoolwork so a large part of it is just avoiding the things where you can avoid conflict um, and just tolerating a bit more chaos than you might normally tolerate and, that, and, and just going easy on yourself if you're if your children are older, it's good to have a talk about a kind of a, a, a bubble plan, right? So we negotiate how we're all going to get through this. And if they're old enough, you can say, look, sometimes I just need half an hour. I just need half an hour. So every so often I'm going to say, hey, kids, watch telly. I'm just going to go to my room for some quiet time. Uh, and then you can come back out. If you can do that, do that. If you're lucky enough to have two parents in the house, a good thing is to tag team. So... So work out a system and it could be an hour each or it could be two hours each or maybe one does one day, one does the next day so that one person is doing the stuff and the other person gets a bit of quiet time. Just find whatever system works for your family and do that. Yep, perfect. Um, and I've heard lots of stories around the way people coming up with their own bubble plans, yeah. um, particularly where there's enough in your bubble to share a bit of the space. Do you have any tips for... Um, sole parents, you know, there's, that's a group that I've thought a lot about during this period. I know that's a hard job 100% um, of the time, but at this particular time, it would be really tough. So based on what you've said, I'm picking up that you're saying, look, a little bit of screen time to give yourself a break. Are there any other things you think they might want to, to think about to support themselves? Yeah, I think it's just going to be, it's going to be, I mean, it's harder on single parents all the time, but it's certainly harder now. Um, if I was a single parent, man, I'd be just taping my kids' faces to telly. I'd be like, hey, kids, <laughs> I'm just going to leave this on for four weeks and I'm just going to sit on the couch. Um, yeah, so, so it is about this stuff. We're, again, with little kids, if you're by yourself, you're just going to have to chug on through and it's just going to be really hard. So it is about doing the things that help yeah. you to remain calm, um, getting your little moments when you can, just accepting the fact that actually for you it's going to be extra tough and sometimes there just isn't a way around that. Um, but as you, if your children are older, it is about negotiating how we get through this stuff and, and keeping on talking to your kids so we can go, okay, Yesterday was a bad day. Everybody got grumpy. We all ended up yelling at each other. Let's make a plan today so that doesn't happen. And, you know, even little kids, they can start to get that stuff. So it's just, mm. it is extra tough as a single parent. Negotiate that stuff yeah. with your older kids if you can. Um, use distractions if you can. Don't feel bad about anything that you're doing. Uh, as long as it's keeping the house quiet and it's keeping everybody's uh, kind of heads together, that's it's done. You make a really good point about talking through what's working, what's not working. Uh, there's a bit of uncertainty for everyone at the moment. We've got an alert level system and we're, uh, of course, using that to indicate to people um, where we are and what will happen when we're there and where we uh, are looking to move to. Um, how do you? How would you suggest that uh, adults um, talk to their young ones uh, around movements through different alert levels and the uncertainty? Of course, we're all um, working really hard towards getting out at the end of four weeks into a different level. But how do we prepare them for what may or may not happen? I think it's. Um, I think a few people have said it's a really good idea not to count down days. Like, don't put a thing up on your calendar. It's like counting down. This would be like counting down to Christmas, and you wake up on Christmas Day, and Santa goes, "Yeah." I'm not going to come today. That would be super disappointing. So it's just about, I think, saying to kids, look, we're going to deal with this stuff day to day. It's going to be a few weeks. We're going to be in here. So this is our little bubble. Yep. You know, in years to come, we'll tell stories at family Christmases about, remember that time? We are all locked up in a house together for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, so it's about not getting hung up on an end point, but dealing with the process stuff as you move through and that's accepting that you know there will be good days and there will be bad days and and there will be days where you know at the end of it your voice might be hoarse from yelling and you have those conversations with the kids where you sit down and you go okay I've got a little bit cross i probably shouldn't have seen <laughs> you know i've had those conversations with my boys it kind of happens but 
it's for me it's more about the process i mean we're doing that with my 17 year old he's itching to get out and i'm saying dude we don't know how long this thing is going to be it could be a few more weeks it could be more than that but it could loosen up a bit we could come back in it's just this is where we are now so let's find a process to make it work i've said to him what do we do that's annoying you at the moment <laughs> how can we be less annoying for you that is generally i think stuff that we do what was the answer to that question well, by the way he, 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 he's um he's he's his own little nerd so his thing is uh, the most annoying thing in his life at the moment is and this is such a 17 year old he said you asked me to come out for dinner and I'll come out for dinner, but it's not there. And I have to stand and wait and it's super annoying. And it's so hard for me not to take the mickey in that point because it's like, okay, <laughs> dude. But, and it's a two way street though, right? Cause he got a grumpy and he gets grumpy and he gets an edge to him. And then we have to just walk it back a little and go, you know, I, I get it, but we have to be, we have to, be respectful to each other to get through this thing. So you, ju you just got to work the process of the stuff in your family. You don't get hung up on dates. I think that kind of sets people up for, for disappointment. It's just, let's, let's keep learning as we go. How do we make today better than yesterday? What's a better system? How do we, how do we have a better system with dishes? We fight less. How can we have a better, a better system for you to contact your friends, all that kind of stuff. There's one other group that I think about quite a bit. Um, obviously, our older New Zealanders and um, uh, uh, lots of work to try and make sure that they're well supported through this time. But there's another group, and that's uh, people who probably um, young adults uh, who may not have long come out of flatting situations or at least have lived very, very social lives and then suddenly um, find themselves completely on their own. And uh, of course, they have the ability um, to keep that social contact, um, but I still really worry about their mental health. Is is there something there around those people who are by themselves, who have had very social lives before that, that you think that we might want to share with them? Yeah, I think it's it's the tr you, you, what you have to do is you have to look at uh, if you look at people who spend a long time in isolation. So you look at people like Antarctic scientists and astronauts, right? So they are literally sometimes in a bubble uh, a long way from people for a long period of time how they get through that stuff um, it, we could learn stuff from that and one of the things is that they have a focus on the mission right so the mission gets them through our mission at the moment is to prevent the spread of this virus and if you're a young person the reality is you're nowhere near as a level of risk as someone older but that's not your mission your mission kind of isn't about protecting yourself your mission is to protect the older people and the people who are vulnerable that's a big mission that we all need to live up to so it's about focusing on the importance of what we're all doing then it's about it is those tried and true things of having uh having rituals and having structure so you kind of you do the things that you do you know don't stay in your pajamas until lunchtime get up have a shower um do the things that you would normally do. It sounds trite, but you talk to, um, you talk to, uh, again, like you talk to people that spend time in space or time in, in the Antarctic sort of in isolation, getting a hobby. Like now is a time to do a thing that you've thought about doing. Maybe you want to write a book. Maybe you wanted to learn to play some musical instrument or learn to speak Arabic or do something kind of, like you have to find something to kind of fill in your time. So those old tried and true things of uh, structure and uh, routine and focusing on the mission, still having time to just do nothing, that's fine. Um, use the technology so you have Netflix watching parties. Um, you watch, you know, young people, if you have not seen The Tiger King, it's genius. It is genius. Get a bunch of so Netflix parties, watching watching TV shows. Absolutely, together. and so there's a whole bunch of stuff that people can do, but it is hard. Um, you just have to do what you guys are good at, like use the technology. You have to link up, and you have to keep thinking. Yeah, okay, it's probably for me meeting up with my friends. We're not terribly at risk from doing this stuff, but what it will do is it will mean all of us will be locked down for longer, and it puts the people who are at risk are even more risk so that is all of our collective mission we have to yep. stay home yep. 
I really like the idea of focusing on on the mission because it, it might otherwise feel like it's something that doesn't have um, purpose to it, but there is lots of purpose even to the simple act of staying home. Yeah, and I think too, like I, I think um, uh, and one other opinion piece I saw that actually was quite helpful. Um, it's this idea that like we're not just staying home and watching telly. Like people are giving a lot of stuff up. A lot of people are sacrificing a lot. You know, they are they are missing contact with loved ones. They are they can't go to funerals or tongues. There's, there's stuff going on. So. It's not that you staying at home is some some small lazy act of thing. It's a it is a sacrifice and it's a noble thing that that we mm. are doing and we should we, we should take pride. If you're the person following the rules and doing what you should, you should take pride from that. Yeah. What I also hear from you, just really, I think summing up around the importance of the mission and that the mission is is actually a big deal and making a difference to people and we shouldn't trivialize the act of staying home um it's also that we should go easy on ourselves um that don't don't be worried so much about having rules and um for kids at this time just to go easy on ourselves is that yeah fair? totally and like you're gonna freak out everyone's gonna freak out we're gonna have freak outs and and that's normal you know people who are already struggling with anxiety and depression that stuff is going you're gonna have days where it's gonna be super hard um, so whilst we must be kind to each other we must also be kind to ourselves and so if you do have a day in your pajamas on the couch crying that's okay <laughs> you know it's fine just the next day um, Get up and, and, and have a shower. Reach out and talk to someone. You know, if you're worried about someone in your networks, connect up with them and ask them how they're doing. Like it's it's really important that we that we look after each other. And if you're worried, ask someone how they're doing. If you're worried that a person may be suicidal, ask them. It's really important. Um that's no one has ever no one has ever killed themselves because someone has asked them that question. So it's an important if people are, you know, depressed and down and, and you're concerned, ask them that stuff and then help them to get some support. Yeah. I think those are really important points to finish on. And I'll just add here as well, if you don't have anyone to reach out to, please always remember 1737. And those who are working in this space, they are essential services that are always available for you. And we really want you to reach out for help um, and hope, of course, that friends and family listening to this continue to reach out to others too. Nigel, some of the tips today you've shared have been fantastic. And I hope people really took something away, whether they've got a a 17 year old or whether they've got a two year old who you nicknamed destructor as we do in our household um there's something in this for for everyone so thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insights and for just reminding us why we should be kind to ourselves on this absolutely session. so thank you